Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to our service of worship this morning. I would especially like to welcome those who are visiting with us. I hope you feel part of this community of faith. I hope you feel uh, welcome and included today. I would invite us all to take a moment to... Uh, oh, actually, before we do that, it's Ross Richards' birthday this week. Happy birthday, Ross. Yeah. 30 what? Catching up with Bucky. Catching up with Bucky, yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Let us all take a moment to quiet ourselves, to still ourselves as we prepare as we prepare for worship today. Whenever Don walks up at the beginning of the service and asks, hands me something, it typically means that somebody left their lights on. And everybody is sitting in the pews thinking, oh God, please don't let it be me. Don't let it be me. It's not that today. It's just a reminder, Kenny Keller's birthday is today. Kenny Keller is not with us today, but he will be watching us uh, later on this week. So Kenny, happy birthday to you too. We enter worship once again this day, choosing to serve you, God, and no other. We enter as witnesses to one another to live out our baptism and to grow into the body of Christ. We enter dependent on the Spirit to be with us in our thoughts and feelings.
presence. Reconciling Christ, we wait for your presence. Comforting Spirit, we wait for your presence. Amen. Our first hymn today is number 220, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, 220. today is from the book of Joshua, reading in the third chapter, verses 7 to 17. The Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they may know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. You are the one who shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua then said to the Israelites, Draw near and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that among you is the living God, who without fail will drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. So now select 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. 
When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan flowing from above shall be cut off. They shall stand in a single heap. When the people set out from their tents to cross over the Jordan, the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant were in front of the people. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So when those who bore the Ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the edge of the water, the waters flowing from above stood still, rising up in a single heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. While those flowing toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea, were wholly cut off. Then the people crossed over, the, over opposite Jericho. While all Israel were crossing over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan until the entire nation finished crossing over the Jordan. Here ends the first lesson. Thank you, Alan. Our reading from the psalm today comes from Psalm 107. It can be found on page 831, and we're reading parts 1 and 4. Page 831, parts 1 and 4. Oh, give thanks, for God is gracious. Let the redeemed of God say so, those redeemed from trouble, from the east and the west. Some lost their way in desert wastes, finding no place to settle. Then they cry to you, God, in their trouble. You rescue them from their distress. Let them thank you, O God, for your steadfast love, for the wonders you do for us. You turn rivers into desert, springs of water into thirsty ground. But you turn desert into standing pools, dry land into springs of water. They sow fields and plant vineyards that yield a, a fruitful harvest. Whoever is wise, ponder these things. Our next hymn is 684, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace, 684.
How's everyone today? Good? Good? I don't know if I have a children's story today or an all-ages story today. So let's try with an all-ages story today because I want to know from everybody what makes them angry. What makes you angry, yeah? Your brother. I knew you were going to say that. Do you know why your brother makes you angry? He annoys you. Uh, annoying, what does that mean? What, is, what do you mean by annoying? Does he hurt your feelings? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about uh, anyone else? What about you, Carol? What makes you angry? That's like being put on the spot, eh? I'm trying not to be angry. We try not to be angry, but we do get angry sometimes, don't we? I have a theory that anger comes out of grief. Comes out of grief. We get angry at somebody because they hurt us, that they did something to us, they betrayed us in a way that we didn't expect and it catches us off guard and we grieve that relationship that we thought we had. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's why it's all ages. That makes sense. And we get angry because it's easier to be angry than it is to be hurt. It's easier to be angry than it is to be hurt. And when we stop being angry, that means we're able to deal with the hurt now that happened. Or not. Or not. Because anger can very easily metastasize into hatred. We need to work at it. We need to understand our feelings. Now, I would say to you that when your brother makes you angry, you look at your brother right in the eye and say, you know, when you do that, it makes me feel sad. No, I bet you if you say, when you do that, it makes me feel sad, all of a sudden, he doesn't want to make you feel sad. And all of a sudden, he'll start thinking about what he's doing and maybe he should be doing something else because he doesn't want you sad. He does. He's your brother. He doesn't want you sad. So, Carol, I've, you know when I lose it with the kids? I just lost it with you guys. <laughs> when somebody makes us angry, and we confront them, and not to fight with them, but we say, when you do that, it makes us sad. Or when you do that, it makes me feel like this. It always stops everything and makes that person think in a different way. If you fight back with them, that just escalates, and then you hurt their feelings. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. If you stop it, it stops. This is how you make me feel when you do that. You try that with your brother, I bet you you're going to find some difference. Yeah, I bet you will. Even brothers respond to this. I say that because I'm a brother. Yeah. Okay, this is Remembrance Sunday. And we talk about not having war. We talk about not fighting. We talk about trying to live in a land where peace abounds where peace abounds, where we work out our differences, where we remember the atrocities that have happened and say we don't ever want to see those atrocities happen again. This is that week. And you look around the world and atrocities are happening. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you. I believe you guys are going down to Sunday school. And even though it was all ages, the older ones are staying. The older ones are staying. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel of Matthew, reading at chapter 23, verses 1 to 12. 
Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have a place of honor at banquets and best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends our reading. of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight O Lord our strength and our redeemer Amen wasn't sure what I was going to talk about today as I said in the children's story we pray for a world of peace where spears are beaten into plowshares we've done that for thousands and thousands of years and over those thousands and thousands of years many plowshares have been beaten into spears bullets and missiles and it gets discouraging when you look out not understanding what's going on and I want to start off today just because our Old Testament reading is the reading where Joshua finally leads the people into the promised land the promised land there's a history around that land. Biblical story will tell us that 
Abraham and Sarah grew up in Ur, which is a little bit north of the Persian Gulf, and they traveled up the Euphrates River to northern Syria, and they settled there for a little while, and then they turned left, and they started down, and they followed the, the Jordan River Valley down to a little place a little bit north of uh, the Dead Sea, and they settled there. They settled there for four generations, and a drought happened and they were whisked off to Egypt. Not sure how long they were in Egypt. We know they were there long enough that the people of, that the Egyptians forgot why they were there, everything that Joseph did. They were enslaved. Moses was born. Moses goes off and, and takes the people out of captivity, follows them through a desert, or leads them through a desert for 40 years, and then just at that border, he dies. And then Joshua takes over, and our reading today has them coming across the Jordan River. If you know anything about geography, they would have had to gone down around the southern tip of Israel, or Palestine, or the Canaan at that time, and then come in from the west in order to cross the Jordan River. They do so. There were peoples there. We read the list of them. The majority of them were Canaanites, and as the Canaanites are basically who our Palestinians are today. And they went in, they took their land, palace there. The Canaanites had been there for approximately a thousand years at that point. Israel's now in control. Eventually, uh, the 12 tribes that come in around a thousand before the common area, for a thousand before, years before Christ, the uh, Saul started to unite some of these 12 tribes and form a kingdom of Israel. There was a civil war. David took over. He continued to unite the rest of the tribes, and during his time, there were a couple of coup attempts that weren't successful, but he was able to expand Israel to its greatest heights. They actually went uh, below the Jordan River, across the Jordan River. His son Solomon, uh, became, uh, and that's when David brought Jerusalem, made Jerusalem the capital at that point. Solomon came in, his son built the temple, so Jerusalem was the focal point politically and religiously now. The Ark of the Covenant was encased in the, in the temple. And then his sons, the time of his sons, the kingdom split into two. Northern Israel and southern Judah. And each one of his sons had, was king of each. But they were a weaker state. And then all around them, empires were developing. Assyrians came in and took over and they ran the place. Persians for a short little while came in and they ran the place. The Babylonians came in and they ran the place. They actually took many of the people there, spread them throughout the Babylonian Empire so that they couldn't revolt. And then... Uh, about 80 years later, Persia rose again, defeated the Babylonian Empire, and the people were allowed to come home, and some of them did come home. And that event, those events, that exodus and that homecoming, were integral parts of the psyche of every Jew even today. But that shaped and defined who they were, who they are, those events. So they come back into Babylon, or they come back from Babylon. Rome, conquest in 63. Rome uh, disintegrated around, around 300 uh, to split between Western and Eastern uh, Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire disintegrated. The Eastern Roman Empire became the Byzantine Empire, and they ruled. And it was Christians that ruled at that time. The Byzantine Empire were Christians and Byzantine Christians, because it changes later. And they ruled. And then the Muslims came in, and they were defeated, and the Muslims ruled for hundreds of years. From about 600 to about 1099, when the Crusades started, and European Christians came down to fight the Muslims and to free Jerusalem. 1291, the Muslims came back in and they ruled. And later on in uh, 1500s, the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Ottoman Empire, was ruling that state until 1917. During World War I, Britain defeated the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans, 
and they took over Israel or Palestine or whatever you want to call it at that time. They took over that land. Uh, during that time, they believed that Zionism was something that they wanted to foster so that all Jewish people could come back to a place where the people originated. And they encouraged that, the British Empire. And a lot of people did, particularly around World War II because of the rise of Hitler and the rise of anti-Semitism that was happening at that time of the year. Not just Hitler, but us as well. There were refugees, shiploads of refugees of Jewish people coming that we turned away from our shores because they were Jews and we didn't want them. Anti-Semitism was real then and it's real now. And we found this land and they wanted this land. And they went there. And the population, the Jewish population rose. It's still not very high, but it rose. In 1947, Britain turned over Palestine to the UN. The UN did a study and they said it should be a two-state country. And they tried to encourage that. But the Arab people didn't like that. But they established, they established the... Uh, the Jewish homeland at that point, 1948. Uh, a lot of the neighboring Arab countries, Muslim countries, didn't like that and they fought. They fought against Israel and Israel won a lot of those battles and in so doing claimed the Gaza Strip and the West Bank at that time, which the UN had given to the Palestinian people. 1940, 1964, or 48, or 1964, the PLO was uh, formed, Palestinian Liberation Organization. A lot of Palestinians left home because of the fighting that was going on, and the PLO uh, came into being, came into power at that time. I remember growing up, they were always fighting. There was always bombings. There was always fighting between Israel and the PLO. PLO in 1993 signed a peace accord with Israel. I remember that. <laughs> signed a peace accord with Israel and in so doing the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were given back to the Palestinian people. Given back to the Palestinian people. And we know over the years militant Israel, Israelites moved in, settlers moved into the West Bank. PLO still wanted peace. They still wanted the, the PLO ruled the West Bank. Hamas ruled the Gaza Strip. PLO wanted peace. Gaza didn't believe that Israel had a right to exist, or uh, Hamas didn't believe that the state of Israel had a right to uh, exist. Never did, never will. Then we had Hamas do that atrocity, dreadful atrocity. And they knew they would be safe because they had six months supply of supplies of stored up and they had tunnels and places underneath hospitals and underneath uh, refugee camps that they knew the Israelites, the Israelis would never bomb because it would be a war crime and the Israelis started bombing them. It is a war crime. Who's right and who's wrong? The answer we hear is it's complicated, and it is. I don't know who's right and who's wrong. There are good things done on both sides and there were horrific things done on both sides. Like I was saying earlier in the children's story, I really do believe that anger comes from grief. And I really do believe that anger can very easily metastasize into hatred. And I think that's what you have over in that part of the world. I don't know the answer. I don't know. I do know part of our job here today is to pray and to hope and to work for peace in the world. 
that we remember the atrocities that happened in the world wars that we were involved in. We remember everything that happened then. We remember the sacrifices people made. We remember the horrific, horrific generational hurts that happened on all sides. Hoping that that does not happen again. We know, we hope for diplomacy to be able to work. That people will be reasonable and talk and compromise and try to come to some order so that something good or something better can happen than what's happening right now. And we also know there's big money in war. People are making a lot of money. Those are all things we know. And the last thing I want to leave you with is that last month there were more children killed in Palestine and Israel than in the previous year in every conflict in the world. 400 children a day. There's no right or wrong. All there is is stop. It's the same God. For thousands of years, Muslims have been there. For thousands of years, Christians have been there. For thousands of years, Jewish people have been there. And it's all the same God. And if your God is calling you to hate You've missed the point. Amen. Let us sing six, seven, eight for the healing of the nation. Six, seven, eight.
Let us pray. Dear God, we confess that we are frightened by our helplessness in the face of natural disasters like hurricanes and human disasters like war. We pray, dear God, for our safety and the safety of our loved ones. We pray, dear God, for the safety of all who stand in harm's way. But if there is no escape from the tumult, no, pray that we will never forget that you are standing in the midst of it with us, that you will never desert us, that you will offer us unlimited comfort and strength to face what must be faced and do what must be done. We pray, dear God, to remember that in times of storm or calm and war or in peace, we are all neighbors, dependent on one another for our survival. O God of every human being, forgive when we identify our kin too easily as enemies. Teach us to seek the good of all and not only our own. When our cousins are acting unjustly or causing harm, help us to constrain them without hatred or evil thoughts, but to seek their good even as we resist the damage that may be caused. We pray that those to whom we are opposed may be turned from enemy to friend. We pray that in our cause we may not fall into sin, so convinced of our own righteousness that we are unaware of our own sin. We pray that we are not so distracted by another sin that we cannot be convinced of their value as children of God. May we always remember your willingness to forgive and to bless and to call the most unlikely of saints. Amen. I'd like to direct your attention to the announcements that are found in your bulletin. First of all, we gratefully acknowledge memorials to the local fund in memory of Carol Vigno from Tanya Fifield, Leah Fiander, Jeanette McDonald and family, Angus and Ruth Coffin. William and Audrey McDonald and Jean McDonald, and a memory of Douglas Jackson from a true friend and companion, Mavis Morrison, and to the cemetery fund a memory of Carol from Bob Hutchinson, and we thank those who have remembered our family past and present in this way. Today's bulletins have been generously donated to honor with pride and remember with love our Canadian soldiers by Dave and Wendy McPhail, and we thank them for that. Flowers in the church today are in loving memory of Floyd Campbell from the family of Paul Anderson, and we thank them for that. Our Remembrance Day service will be here, held here at our church this Saturday, November 11th, at 9 a.m. with Father Anthony O'Connell uh, giving the message. There's an information session pertaining to grants and other government programs uh, for seniors or for low-income families, Thursday, November 7th from 2 to 4 in McLeod's Hall. Uh, if you are interested or know of someone who will be interested in that, please pass that information along. Board of Stewards are meeting Wednesday, November 8th at 7 o'clock in the Reverend Ray Purchase Room. Session committees are meeting Thursday, November 16th at 7 with session to follow at 7.30. And the official board will be meeting on Thursday, November 23rd at 7 p.m. in the boardroom. So please make note of all those meeting dates. The Dinner Club are looking at getting together on Wednesday, November 15th. Uh, This club offers an opportunity to gather for fellowship. We gather in the morning, prepare the meal, come back around 2 to cook. And during the cooking stage, we gather as community. We chat, play cards, games, knit, put together puzzles. We eat it together at four, and for those who uh, can come and are able, the help is required to prepare the meal in the mornings and to clean up afterwards. Uh, 2024 envelopes are now in the lobby. If you would like to cut down, help us cut down on expenses for postage, if you could pick yours up. If there's a neighbor there that you see that's not here today, if you want to pick theirs up and drop it off, that would be uh, helpful as well. Men's Brotherhood are holding a pancake and sausage breakfast on Saturday, November 18th from 8 to 10 in McLeod's Hall. Tickets are $10 and available from any member of the Brotherhood or from the church office. 
Uh, Jill McLeod is offering to do a wreath-making course this year. Materials will be supplied. The cost is $40 a person, with, and registration is required for that. Uh, you can please phone or email the office if you're interested. We're also looking at helping families in our community during our, the Christmas uh, season. Uh, if you are, uh, know of someone, uh, please pass that information on. It's all kept strictly confidential, and as the season progresses, we'll be asking people for help to, to support them. Yesterday was the uh, fall fair, and I believe it was a very successful fall fair. Congratulations to the Guild for hosting that, and uh, for thank you for everyone who took part and helped support that as well. Uh, there is a bit of home cooking left over that we will be selling after the service. If you want to go out and around to McLeod's Hall, uh, downstairs to McLeod's Hall, uh, there will be somebody down there. Are they on sale or is it regular price? <laughs> Clearance sale? I don't know. I don't know. As Alfie would say, it's for the church. It's for the church. Now I have our minute for mission. The minute for mission today is about a program of the United Church uh, called uh, 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. And it runs from October 10th to December the 1st. Uh, it offers daily and weekly opportunities for learning, reflection, and action. The program, designed to move people through a journey towards becoming anti-racist, offers an opportunity for participants within the United Church and beyond to engage in learning and develop their faith. The learnings encourage deep, thought-provoking discussion for both individuals and communities of faith. Written reflections, video workshops, and readings explore internalized racism, systemic racism, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, and more. The United Church of Canada has committed to becoming an anti-racist denomination, and this work is an ongoing journey for everyone. Your mission and service gifts support expanding this crucial initiative each year. 40 days of engagement on anti-racism materials are available at any time on the United Church website. Live sessions are and shared on YouTube. Thank you, Alan. Florence Sturgis' birthday is coming up on November 9th. Happy birthday, Florence. Are there any other birthdays? This was a busy week. Oh, Karen? Oh, Shirley's birthday. Well, you wish her a happy birthday for us. Thank you. We'll now have the presentation of our offering.
pray. With these gifts, O God, we commit ourselves again to tending the light of Christ with our words and deeds of compassion and justice. Anoint us in these gifts with patience and wisdom to do your will. Amen. Roger Burns told me his birthday's next year. So happy birthday, Roger. <laughs> Our final hymn today is 595, We Are Pilgrims, 595. day with the glory of God's anticipation moving through us. With active longing we await inspiration, clarity of purpose, and new gifts of the Spirit. Go with the light of God, the affirming love of Jesus Christ, and the ever-renewing power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>